everybody, and welcome back to Ghost Education 101. I know it's been quite a while since we've been live, so we're so excited tonight to be here with one of my favorite people in the paranormal world, Lloyd Auerbach. So excited. Um, so if you don't know who he is, uh, let me give you a little background. You should all know who he is if you're in the um, paranormal field, but um, he's also known as uh, Professor Paranormal, which I love. And if you haven't seen that show, it's on your, um, not on your personal page, but on your fan page. He does a show with questions, questions and answers, which is really, really great. So be sure to check that out. Uh, you're an author of 10 books, many, 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 many articles. Uh, Lloyd has a master's degree in parapsychology. Uh, you're on faculty at Atlantic University, JFK University. And you also teach classes at the Ryan Research Center, which is amazing. So we're going to put up the link to that. So be sure to check out, um, see what classes are coming up. I did one last fall with you that was advanced field investigation. That right. was great. So right. everybody be sure to check those out. So you've also been on David Letterman, Chris Angel, which I bet that was quite fun. Um, the Today Show, Unsolved Mysteries, uh, In Search Of, which I love that show. So we're really excited tonight, and your presentation is Evidence of Survival of Bodily Death. So we're going to let you go ahead and get started, and we'll All share right. your screen. And if anybody has questions, we're going to be monitoring okay. those, and we can ask at the end of the presentation. Okay, so this is going to be um, a little different, perhaps, than what other, other things you've seen, but... Someone in the field of parapsychology, one area that we do research is life after death or survival of bodily death. The idea that consciousness can survive the death of the body. It's uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about evidence here in a bit. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the, the different types of phenomena and experiences that provide us support for that concept as we go through as well. If I can get the slides to advance properly here. And let me try that again. All right. There we go. So the first question is, are we looking for evidence or for proof of survival? Because there's a big difference. Uh, when you do field investigations, you are not looking for proof. You're looking for evidence. And it's a preponderance of evidence that supports a conclusion, a hypothesis, a theory, or whatever else. We have no way of actually proving so many things in science, because really what we're talking about here is whether or not proof is an acceptance by people as truth. So in some respects, you get enough evidence and people look at it and say, oh yeah, that's what, that makes sense. That's proof. Uh, the other thing is, it depends on the, the reasoning one has, the statements, what you can bring in to support that statement, the theories that come together. In science, it's really difficult to come up with proof. In fact, for the most part, because science is a body of ever-changing knowledge, not a set of facts and that's it. Science is a method. It is, there is information, obviously. We have a lot of evidence, we have ideas, but so many things that have been established as proof keep getting thrown out because we get new evidence. We, we have new ways of looking at things. We come up with new technologies to look deeper. For example, the Webb telescope that's looking deeper into the universe than ever before. Scientific proof in Western science, at least, for physical sciences, is based on empirical evidence. You do you come up with a question to test, you, a theory to test. You must test those things. We do that in parapsychology in the laboratory. You gather data. You do interpretation. You with things in the laboratory. You look for experiments. You try to do replication. In the natural world outside the lab, it's not always that easy to re, to recreate or replicate the situation because you can't replicate the exact or even close to the exact conditions. So for example, for many, many centuries, meteorites didn't exist. In fact, for a long time, even in developing science, empirical science, eh, no such thing as meteorites. Uh, rocks falling from the sky, yeah, no, 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 no. Took a while for a major meteor storm in France and enough physical evidence gathered before mainstream science accepted that. And we can also point to things like people saying that it was impossible other than perhaps with balloons or similar devices for a powered 
lighter than air or powered aircraft. In fact, for about three weeks after the Wright brothers flew, in full view of witnesses, including journalists at Kitty Hawk in the early 20th century, people around the world, scientists and others and engineers said, no, this is not possible. So in many respects, science is a search for truth, but that truth can change. And what we learn about things can change. The mindset's different. Science, however, is a method. It, it really is dealing with evidence. It's dealing with hypotheses. It's dealing with theory. And really, in many respects, looking for disproof. Because you, when you create a theory, you have to come up with a way to falsify it, to say, if here's the theory, but if this is going on, it's an exception to the rule or if disproves the theory, it, it doesn't cover everything. And I encourage folks who are doing research or field investigation, any kind of investigation when it comes to the paranormal, to really consider the difference between proof and evidence, because there's a big difference. And then you have good evidence and bad evidence. So if I want to bring up a, a mentor of mine. It was a colleague and mentor of mine by the name of Marcello Truzzi. He is often mis slightly misquoted or popularized his statement by the skeptics organizations. And I have skeptics in quotes because really those organizations and those people are pseudo skeptics, as Marcello would put it. They're, they call themselves skeptics, but they're not really skeptical. They have already decided that this stuff doesn't exist. They have already decided that anybody who believes in the paranormal or psychic phenomena is gullible or an idiot. Um, they giggle when you mention things. Marcello made this statement that extraordinary claims require, require extraordinary evidence, not extraordinary proof. But the skeptics lo love to talk about proof. And it's interesting that many of the ones who are doing it, doing that, talking about proof, are scientists themselves who don't have proof for much of what they are studying in their own field. Good example. We have no absolute proof of the human consciousness. We can't prove survival. We can get evidence for it because we don't have objective evidence, empirical evidence. We can't test whether there's an afterlife. Now, there are some things we can test, of course. We are looking mainly at subjective experience evidence. That's the majority of what we look for. And I'll get into a little bit about the tech in a bit. But the fact is that parapsychology, which studies apparitions, ghosts, hauntings, poltergeists, psychic phenomena, we are a social science because we're dealing with human experience. I know there are a lot of folks out there, especially on the TV shows, who completely throw out what they call anecdotal evidence, and yet their own experiences apparently count for something, which were anecdotal in and themselves. The reality is that we're dealing with phenomena, with experiences that we can't even investigate without a human being to begin with. In other words, if you don't have a witness or somebody who had an experience, how do you know a place is haunted? If you don't have a person interacting with an apparent ghost, how do you know there's somebody there? You have to have some human to start with. You can bring in technology if you, all you want, but the tech is not designed to detect something that we have no clues to what it what it's made out of. We, we really don't. All we can say is we're getting anomalous readings in the environment. Without a human being to give that context, we just have anomalous readings. Again, because those devices cannot be designed to detect something when we don't even have a starting point of to what that thing should be or is, or how it affects the environment for that matter. So we are dealing with subjective experience, what Vernon Nepi called many years ago, subjective paranormal experience. Now we can get really good information and evidence as you'll hear tonight, but we're interpreting that evidence in a particular way or in a couple of different ways. There is always potential in these experiences that people report for an alternative psychic or psi explanation. Psi is simply, it's not an acronym. It doesn't stand for anything. It is the 23rd letter of the Greek alphabet, represents psyche or mind or consciousness. Uh, J.B. Ryan, who's kind of the father of modern laboratory research back in the 30s, used that instead of calling it an X factor or something else to cover extrasensory perception information without the senses. It covers psychokinesis, movement directly by the mind, and it covers certainly things like apparitions and hauntings and poltergeists and reincarnation, all that stuff. It's all psi phenomena. But there are different ways to look at that information. 
and those experiences that may or may not represent evidence for life after death, depending on how you're looking at it. Because a lot of this, especially the concept that consciousness survives the death of the body, is a major disagreement with materialist philosophy, with empirical materialism, which is the base of most science or physical sciences today, going back to the Industrial Revolution and the rise of empiricism back in the 1800s. So are you a materialist? Do you believe that the brain is it? Or do you believe that there's something more than the brain? Bruce Grayson, who is at the University of Virginia Medical School, the Division of Perceptual Studies. Uh, this is a group that was started originally by Ian Stevenson back in 1960 uh, with looking at originally reincarnation research. We'll talk about that here in a bit. Grayson specializes in the overall evidence, but specifically in near-death experiences. So back at a conference for the Forever Family Foundation, which I'm president of, uh, back in 2008, actually, he laid out some really good pointers here. And the best evidence for survival comes from evidence that people living now had lived before. We'll talk about that. Evidence that people now deceased still exist in some form. And evidence that the mind can function independent of the brain. All of those are important for us, for the concept of survival. Now, surviving death and studying that, we can gather all that evidence, but Harder to get is evidence of what the what that afterlife might be like. And we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about that. But let's start with a root question. What is it that survives? And we talk about consciousness, the thing that makes us us, individuals. But there are so many definitions. And it's a major question. That first question, what is consciousness, is a major question in science. It's looked at, being looked at by neuroscience, it's being looked at by physics, it's being looked at by psychologists, certainly by parapsychologists, and there are, there's a small number of people who call themselves consciousness researchers. In other words, they're trying to do an interdisciplinary study of what is consciousness, that question. So one particular way of looking at it, and there, these are all different ways of looking at consciousness, is it's a degree of awareness of ourselves in the environment, self-awareness. There's a, actually a recent article that I started to read, I haven't had a chance to finish it, um, last week, about crows being clearly self-aware. I think, I think we can say that our dogs and cats are probably pretty self-aware as well. The ability to process or in, and integrate information defines consciousness. That's a definition by a man named Giulio Tononi. And it's a really interesting book called Phi, P-H-I. And the idea is that a cockroach has consciousness. It just doesn't have as much ability to process and integrate information as your dog or cat or a chimpanzee or a human being. Kind of have a, a spectrum of consciousness in that way. Some folks see consciousness as the sum total of our experience, memory, thoughts, our feelings, or sensations. It's the mind. It's the spirit. It's the soul. Physicists often talk about there being a fundamental property of the universe that they call consciousness, but they're not talking about the same thing, the kind of consciousness that's in a human being. When it comes right down to it, though, we have no definition for consciousness that people agree on. We have no proof. We have evidence. But we don't actually know that consciousness exists. One thing I can point out is there's a group of people in physics and other in philosophy that have suggested that we live in a simulation like the matrix. So does that mean we, we literally have no consciousness and the brain doesn't even have consciousness because we're just a simulation? It's a difficult question. It's why one cannot prove the existence of ghosts. Can't prove consciousness in a living people person. How do you prove consciousness without the body? Not unless we have a lot of cooperation from apparitions from ghosts. Now, Ambrose Bierce in a, in a great book called The Devil's Dictionary, which you can find on Amazon, you can find it free on the Internet Archive. He defined mind as a mysterious force of matter secreted by the brain. Its chief activity consists in the endeavor to ascertain its own nature, the futility of the attempt being due to the fact that it has nothing but itself to know itself with. So our consciousness can study everything in the world, but how do you study yourself? That's a tough one. Uh, science fiction comic books have dealt with this question quite a bit. This is a panel, a couple of panels from uh, a Dr. Solar comic book from 20, 2010, Jim Shooter. 
And it, the thing, if you look in the upper right, Dr. Sanders Gale has theorized that consciousness exists in a quantum field generated by brain cells and that the field may persist even after the brain is annihilated. That's an interesting thing. And if you read a lot of science fiction and comic books, you run into all sorts of really interesting ideas about consciousness. Um, because in science fiction and comic books, one can speculate. Uh, even if you're a physicist, you may have to publish under a different name. But you can speculate and ask people what they think about that. All right, so there's ways, there's different philosophies about, just in ge generally about human beings and about the world around us. In materialism, the mind is the brain. The brain is the mind and vice versa. So it just, we're just meat robots. We're flesh robots. We're programmed a certain way. We have no real full free will. We react in certain ways that is a part of our programming. We get programmed as we, as we grow and we get more memory and more experiences. But when you die, you die, that's it. There's dualism, and there's many forms of dualism uh, where the mind is different from the brain, whether it is in addition to the brain, generated by the brain, whether it's coming into the body and brain from the outside, kind of like a cable TV signal comes into a TV set, which we would be the TV set, of course. There's animism, which suggests that consciousness is in everything. And by the way, that animism is, you might almost say it's a primary philosophy and the base of a lot of, of ancient and indigenous religions. But all philosophies that are out there affect the portrayals of consciousness in culture in pop and especially in pop culture. Uh, a lot of people, what people believe today comes from popular culture, from which includes social media, by the way. It'd be movies, TV, literature, literature including comic books, science fiction, all sorts of things. Uh, it includes social media. It is modern folklore in many respects. And there's an awful lot of modern folklore created by the TV shows, especially the ghost hunting shows. So there is some really interesting evidence, again, not proof, but evidence that consciousness is at least partially independent of the brain. One example would be something called hydrocephalus or water on the brain, where a portion of the brain tissue is actually fluid with no neurons in it. Uh, there have been a few extreme examples. There is one in particular from years gone by where a man walked into a doctor's office because he had some issues, um, headaches, just some other things, but he was fully functional. And when they did a scan of his brain, uh, you know, an x-ray of his brain it turned out that most of his cerebral cortex was gone. It was fluid. He shouldn't have been able to talk, let alone walk. He was fully functional. Um, I just noted on social media and actually in some articles that Emily Clark, apparently from uh, Game of Thrones, has some brain issues, but she's fully functional. What we find is that not only do things get rerouted if people have brain issues, but sometimes pieces of the brain are not working or missing, and yet people still can do what they should, shouldn't should not be able to do with that part of the brain missing or that some sort of damage. So that indicates that consciousness is slightly different. There are deathbed examples of mental functioning, what's called hyperlucidity. And this is being studied more and more today. People who are on their deathbed in hospice, for example, they might have had Alzheimer's. They might have been in coma. They might be sedated where they come out of that state. They come out of sedation. They come out of coma. They come out of dementia, out of Alzheimer's, and can carry on perfectly normal conversations with people. And then they say, I'm going. Or and in many respects, what's reported along with some of these hyperlucid situations is that individual saying, oh, my parents are here to take me to the next step. Or my, my son, my daughter, whoever had passed away, somebody who had passed away, who had died, is there. They see that person or persons who are there to help them die and transition to the next step. And then they go back into that other state and they pass away. So we hear stories about this. I've actually talked to hospice workers who have seen examples of this. Uh, my late friend, Annette Martin, according to her husband, she, uh, she was a psychic and medium I worked with for many years. And in 2011, she got diagnosed with cancer uh, of the tongue, uh, kind of under her tongue and that in her mouth, it, and then through her body. But they actually cleared her in July, a few months after she was diagnosed. Um, Stanford Medical cleared her completely. And yet a couple of weeks later, she started having back pain, went in to see a doctor for that, 
turned out the cancer had come back with a vengeance. And two weeks later, she was dead. On her deathbed, she had been sedated because of pain, but on her deathbed, she did come out of it. She got hyperlucid. She saw her parents. Apparently, two of her students who were mediums were also there with Bruce, her husband, and they saw Annette's parents as well. Bruce got a feeling of presence. So <clears throat> Annette basically said goodbye to everybody who was alive. Uh, she had been under sedation. She went back under sedation and passed away. Her parents apparently took her with her. With near-death experiences, we have mental activity, sometimes with severe brain or lowered brain activity or impairment to a point where there should be absolutely nothing remembered from that state. And yet some people, Pam Reynolds is a famous case, a woman undergoing brain surgery where her, her body temperature was so lowered that they could not measure any brain activity, which is what they expected, uh, including no brain activity when loud noises were next to her ears. And yet she remembered floating above her body and looking down and being able to just later on being able to describe the actual surgery with fairly close accuracy, something that shouldn't have happened. And the doctors were not narrating. That's another piece. Uh, there are out-of-body experiences people have had with totally accurate perception. And on occasion, people, when the, somebody goes out of their body, they travel someplace and they're observing people. Sometimes those people who are being observed by the out-of-body presence see that individual or sense the presence or get an idea that they're there. Now, when we talk about the evidence and the things we want to talk about, the main things we want to talk about tonight, we have a number like out-of-body experiences, which you're not dead. Your body's not dead. So it's not strictly survival, but it does show that consciousness or at least part of your consciousness seems to be able to be located away from your body. An out-of-body experience. Out-of-body experiences happen very often in near-death experiences. And then there's other pieces that happen as well, which I'll talk about. Mediumship, of course. They're talking to somebody. It seems that way. And there's some elements I'll talk about specifically why this is suggestive and why it's more forceful. And then, of course, many of you may do electronic voice phenomena or some other form of instrumental transcommunication, which can be suggestive of consciousness outside the body or a spirit or a ghost or something else. Much more direct on rare occasions is ITC and EVP, and I'll explain those rare occasions in a bit. Mediumship evidential mediumship where the person is having so much getting so much direct information and it seems very much to observers that, and to the medium that this is a conversation and there's unusual brain activity happening in the head of that medium something that's been studied we'll, we'll talk about uh cases of apparitions and discarded entities we often use that term in the in the older especially in the older um research journals but apparitions are ghosts, people who stuck around after death. Well, some of those cases are a little difficult to explain away in any other way. And then there are cases of children who remember previous lives or reincarnation cases. But within parapsychology, there is still a philosophical divide. Not everyone is a dualist. Not everyone's a materialist. We have people who are, are both or either. Um, and looking at the evidence of these experiences, someone who's a, a true materialist may come up with some alternative ways of explaining it using ESP and even psychokinesis. The question when we're dealing with mediums, for example, right off the bat is, where's the information coming from? Is the medium picking it up from an actual spirit? Or is the medium picking up from the mind of the sitter, the person who is the relative of that person who's died or the loved one? Even with EVP, is that information coming from or those voices coming from a spirit that's affecting the device or a living person that's affecting the device? And there's really good support that it's often the living person that's doing it, not a dead person. So we have to look at what in any of these circumstances is where is the psi? Where is the ESP? Where is the psychokinesis? Where is this coming from? Is it from the survival side? Is it from someone who is deceased, passed over? Or is it from someone who's alive? Or is it a combination of those? And very often there's a combination. In fact, you can't see a ghost without you having some psychic ability. 
we talk about out of body experiences again we're you know people could feel like they're out of their body i mean if you've ever hopefully i'm not doing this to you but if you ever sat through a really boring lecture in college or in school at all and you kind of go somewhere else uh, you may feel like you're not in your body but that's not really an out of body experience of course it's that your perceived center of consciousness your perspective is located outside your body where you're looking at surroundings where your mind is picking up the surroundings is coming from a different perspective could be above you could be in another room or someplace else and it may include seeing your physical body now <clears throat> as evidence for survival the evidence is based on personal experience it's subjective but on many occasions there is verifiable information because the person went somewhere was able to come back and describe where they went but that and that involves extrasensory perception so in other words you're out of your body you don't have a physical body you don't have eyes in which to see so how are you seeing that place that you've just gone to and that would be through esp extrasensory perception it's perception but it's not sensory and whether or not it's from your actual body thinking that you went someplace that's a question people have like remote viewing or that you actually sent part of you or all of you, your spirit went out of your body and was in that location that could look around and come back. And then we have the perceptions of the out-of-body travelers, very often confirmed after the fact that the person also had an out-of-body experience. In other words, somebody said, hey, calls calls you up and says, hey, did you, were you like, did you have a weird experience where you're out of your body or having a dream about me? Because I could swear you're st standing in the room with me last night. And then if you had that experience, that's a real connection. And then there have been studies to see whether or not that out-of-body presence can activate or affect the real world physical devices. Now that could be long distance psychokinesis, or it could actually be that part of you went out of your body and was able to muck about a little bit. And if folks are interested, the research was done uh, quite a bit of this research was done at the American Society for Psychical Research in the 1970s and 80s. There's a video um, <clears throat> on uh, YouTube. You can find it's called uh, ASPR OBE Exper Experiment. Near-death experiences will often include that out-of-body experience, but not always. Uh, the true definition is a profound psychological event that may occur to a person close to death or if not near death in a situation of physical or emotional crisis. Now we typically separate in parapsychology, they gotta be pretty much close to death and there has to be a bio, biological kind of drop point where you're pretty much, if you don't get better, you're gonna die. If you don't get resuscitated, you're gonna be dead dead with that. And INS.org, by the way, is the International Association of Near-Death Studies. The characteristics of a near death, of a true near death experience, a true NDE, can will include or may include an out-of-body experience with a perception of what's going on around the body. May move through darkness or a tunnel or across a bridge. Believe it or not, some parts of the world, people don't see that light at the end of the tunnel because they don't see a tunnel. They see a bridge over a river or stream. It's a nice sunny day and there's a flower garden on the other side. There'll be a bright light beyond the darkness or that flower garden. There are often encounters with deceased relatives or loved ones, sometimes with spiritual or religious figures, sometimes just with a light that seems to have consciousness with that. Most experiences are not negative. There are some negative NDEs on record where people did go to hell. At least they thought they did. There's often a sense of oneness with the universe and a perception of that where they are is some kind of spiritual realm, a garden, a city of light, something like that. By the way, they sometimes also think they, they are not only one with the universe, that they have all sorts of knowledge, but when they come back out of the NDE, they don't remember what that was. So are NDEs in and of themselves, are they evidence for survival? There's certainly evidence of separation of consciousness from the brain. The out-of-body experiences with verifiable, veridical perceptions are often local to the body, but sometimes not sometimes the person travels around the hospital where their body is lying in an operating room and they sometimes can report back things that were going on elsewhere in the hospital completely outside of their sensory range 
out of body experience was ver ver verifiable perceptions much beyond the range of normal senses. So sometimes they'll pick up things that uh, even locally that they would never have noticed with their normal senses or things that are actually hidden, like something perhaps that's in an envelope in the room, something you do, do real ESP with. And there have been reports of out-of-body visuals, visual perceptions by the blind. It's evidence of consciousness moving on to a level of existence or reality. Certainly that's something that's associated with the idea of surviving consciousness. There are people who report having an encounter with someone they knew. And when they, they come out of it, what they didn't know is that person was already dead or had just died. So there are encounters with the deceased where the NDE or did not know that person was dead or they did know the person was dead. In fact, that's pretty common. Uh, as far as religious figures go, it's really interesting because uh, there have been studies cross-culturally and Hindus see Hindu gods and Christians will often see a saint if they're Catholic or they'll see Jesus or something connected to the religion. You find that there's a, if they're very religious, you find that connection that's there, but it's all subjective. It's all individual. But there is that similarity of experiences, emotions, the impact with the afterlife. And after they come out of it, many people are philosophically changed. Their belief around death is very different. Sometimes their personality is different. Sometimes they have psychic experience abilities after they come back out of this. But the problem here is it's near death, not dead dead. The person is near death, not actually deceased. Or maybe they were deceased, but we resuscitated them. The brain still has some activity going on, though. That's that's the issue. But still survival, it supports the concept that something's there that can separate, that has greater powers, you might say, than the brain does. All right, reincarnation. First, oh, about a billion and a half people believe this in the world. Probably more at this point. Um, at one point, there were more people believing in reincarnation than there were uh, members of Facebook. Now, I think Facebook's up to 2.4 billion. So uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, many, many other religions in the world actually have belief in reincarnation. Uh, not a lot of indigenous peoples have believed in reincarnation and still do for that matter. And even the early Christians, this was not a, a, a terrible thing. Um, it was removed as a possible factor by the Council of Nicaea um, with the Catholic Church, but people in the early days did believe in potential for reincarnation. And it, it has different flavors, different variations, of course. Karma is part of it. Uh, some people believe you have to be reincarnated. You're going to continually be reincarnated again and again until you, your soul is so good that you become part of, of God, basically become part of the Godhead. Others will, will say, well, you know, maybe you come back once or twice, but that's it. You may have learned your lesson at that point. So back to Bruce Grayson. <clears throat> and actually, Jim Tucker is the leading authority on reincarnation cases these days. Works with Bruce Grayson at the University of Virginia. And he's written a number of books, one of which was called Return to Life. Another is called Life Before Life. And he was the inheritor of the mantle of Ian Stevenson, who began doing this kind of research in 1960 uh, and really set the set the groundwork, the foundation for this. <clears throat> so what's happening with these cases of the reincarnation type or court cases, memories of a previous life that come through the good cases, they can be corroborated. There's a way to actually confirm these memories. There are more importantly, personality traits, likes and dislikes, even food allergies seem to carry through from a previous life that the person is remembering. There are often unlearned skills. So a kid suddenly picks up a violin and can play it like a virtuoso because in their previous life, they were a virtuoso. There are, in a small percentage of the cases that we'll talk about here, um, about 15%, there are birthmarks or birth defects that match the memory this, this person has of how they died and the actual records of how they died. So for example, um, a someone remembers, a child remembers having been a, a, a little girl remembers having been a guy and he was out riding his bike. He's a married guy. He had a couple of young kids. He was out riding his bike on the streets in his town in India. 
He got hit by a truck. His left side was crushed. The girl can remember that, but also remembers the names of the people. It was actually the address of his previous home, of her previous life's home. Uh, a lot of different aspects that are very were verified. This is a real case, by the way. And she had a big birthmark on her left side that matches the mode of death of that previous personality. But for the most part, we are looking at spontaneous recall, so without asking, by adults and children. And the majority of the cases are focused on children, usually under of the ages of two to five, four or five years old. The principal themes of the memories, the mode of death, they remember how they died. They remember people or events, especially from the end of life, but sometimes throughout their life. And there are some events between death and the subject's own birth. Sometimes they remember this, sometimes they don't. So the average time period between the, the death of the remembered previous life and the conception, you know, plus nine months is birth, the conception of the new person remembering that previous life, the average is about 15 months, but it can be, can be decades. Typically, it's closer to that 15 months. So some of the behaviors related to the previous life or emotions towards the previous family, how much they miss them, things like that. Phobia is really interesting. Um, a child has this incredible phobia for no apparent reason to water, but remembers having been someone who drowned. The likes and dislikes to foods and even addictive substances comes through. There are themes in play that represent the previous life and even cross-gender behavior that seems to relate. So a man is reborn as a, a girl or vice versa. So when we're dealing with this, one of the reasons that children are dealt with is because kids only have a certain amount of information built up in their heads. Think about a three-year-old and how much information that child could possibly have versus an adult who has been, especially in our world, the Western world has been around movies, TV, books, education, uh, socializing, social media, all sorts of things. So in the 1950s, there was a case that became a book which became a bestseller called The Search for Bridie Murphy. Um, a psychiatrist was doing hypnosis on a woman who under hypnosis remembered having been, or said she remembered having been a woman, an Irish woman in County Cork, Ireland, years, many, many years before. And he was able to get all sorts of detail out of her and all of this. And it was a very controversial case. The book sold a lot. It certainly was one of the things that's that's caught Stevenson's attention and the attention of many other people. And out of that, other people started doing hypnotic regression and finding that some people often referred to, remembered a past life. But the problem here is the actual basic problem of hypnosis. And that is when you hypnotize someone, Hypnosis is a cooperative effort. The person being hypnotized is cooperating with the hypnotist or hypnotherapist and may even have an expectation. So people who go for past life regression, for hypnosis, for past, to find out what their past lives were, they always, already believe they had a past life. If a hypnotist says, go back now to your childhood, tell me about your childhood, go back now to your, to your infancy, what do you remember from the womb, go back before your birth. What was your previous life like? All of that is suggestion. And it's not hard for an adult to come up with a story. One of my colleagues, Carrie Gaynor, who is one of the two people with Barry Taff on the famous entity case, is a hypnotherapist. Um, years ago, we had a whole discussion of past life regression because he did past life regression therapy as a therapeutic tool using that story from the past life to help inform what's going on in the person's life today. It's, an, it's a really powerful tool that therapists can use to help the people today, whether the past life was real or not. But Carrie would occasionally, would typically get interested in asking questions of that past life person under hypnosis, like, uh, you know, where'd you poop? What were your uh, sanitary conditions like? What were your typical meals like? What'd you eat for breakfast? What was your day to day? You know, these were people not, sometimes come up with, fun, with famous past lives, but usually not necessarily that. Uh, in some instances, the detail came through. Uh, you can ask a child who has strong past life memories about mundane things, and you will often get that information. 
you can ask someone under hypnosis those things, but if they're if the story that they're coming up with, real or not, uh, but if it mainly came from movies and TV and speculation, they're not going to know what, what a where a farmer in the 12th century Fran in France, what their sanitary situation was like. Let's put it that way: elimination situation. They're not going to know what the typical diet was of a 12th century farmer in France. There's a lot that you're not going to know because we don't learn that stuff. And it's not in movies or if it's in the movies, it's wrong as we know. So typically th then there's the issue of what's called cryptomnesia that you may have information. In fact, we all have information in our heads and we, we don't know where that came from. Uh, I remember with my wife, um, when we first got married, we were down in LA uh, where she's from, I was sitting at a breakfast place. And some of you may remember this guy. There was a male model named Fabio, who was often the cover model for a lot of romance novels. And he was at the table with a couple of his friends, few of his friends, I think there were four of them at the table next to us. And we're, Julie and I are talking. And I'm hearing Fabio and the other folks, are, they're talking about the history of the Catholic Church. And I got to say, he sounded really well informed. Now, if I wasn't listening in consciously, that information is still in my head. And somewhere along the line, somebody might ask me a trivia question about the history of the Catholic Church. And boom, I know that answer, even though I have no clue, because I didn't remember that I had that I overheard this conversation. So we have a lot of stuff in our heads. We overhear, we, we read, we, the kind of glosses past our conscious memory. And that can come out in hypnosis as well. So we always look for spontaneous recall. And again, we look for little kids because the odds of them having an extensive amount of information to pull from, not likely. So the really good cases of reincarnation, of the reincarnation type, which have enough information provided by this child to track down the previous personality, the family and everything else. And, to, and also there, once one investigates these cases, when Tucker and the others investigate them, they really try to eliminate any possible source of contamination. Did the parents happen to know the people who were connected to this past life personality? Is this a local person? Is this someone from far away? What's the connection informationally? Could, could it have been through social media? Things like that. So the court cases support either survival of consciousness or some, uh, some way of copying of consciousness or memories from the past. You know, we have a lot of questions still in science about memory itself and where it is in the brain, if it's even in the brain. Maybe we're tapping into something, <clears throat> the Akashic records or something like that. But the way the child, especially children, are behaving, it's very clear that they say, I was this person in my, my previous mom, my last mom, my last dad, my, my kids from my previous life. That's how the kids are talking. I am is different than I was in those circumstances, which leads me to possession because people have said, well, maybe these are possession cases. Well, it's pretty weird if they are because the kid otherwise is per per fully functional. Uh, it's memories of the past life. Yes, it is skills and things and food allergies and things. Some of that does fade. The uh, phobias may not fade. The, the food allergies may not fade. The memories themselves may fade while the child grows up, especially when they get to about six or seven. There's not any indication of possession any other in any other way. And in possession, it pretty much seems that, for example, in trance mediumship, the person speaking through the medium, I, I was or I am this person. And it's pretty clear that this is spiritual rather than memory. But the question is, what is reincarnated here? Is it consciousness? Is it spirit, soul? Is it memory? We don't know. And now we come to probably my favorite topic, apparitions. That's the term we use for ghosts. So here's my definition, culled from the definitions of others in the field. So an apparition is that which is perceived, seemingly seen, heard, felt, or smelled, rarely tasted, I think, and is related to some part of the human personality, mind, soul that can somehow exist in our physical universe after the death of his or her body or their body or projected outside the, the living body. And we do focus on human apparitions, but pets have been reported as well. 
But the key here is perceived, and I'm going to talk about that. Most importantly, apparitions are interactive. They are self-aware or seeming to be that way. So when you add interactivity and self-awareness, you get consciousness. And apparitions then therefore support the idea of survival of consciousness. A term you'll see in older um, literature is discarnate entities or an entity that is without a body. I am an incarnate entity. You are all incarnate entities, I'm assuming. Um, but if you don't have a body, you're a discarnate entity. And of course, the pictures here from Ghost in the lower left and from the old TV show Topper, which I was watching when I was probably about two or three years old and kind of set me on a, on a pathway. Of course, there was always Casper the Friendly Ghost. We have different categories of apparitions within parapsychology. There are crisis apparitions, which are projections. They may not be apparitions the way we think of them, um, this is when someone is in a physical, severe physical, or often a severe emotional psychological crisis, and they appear to someone who knows them basically for help. So it could be somebody trapped somewhere, and they appear elsewhere. Uh, there's a movie with Zac Efron called Charlie St. Cloud, which I recommend because there's a crisis apparition and an apparition of the dead. Both of them are, uh, are in that movie. Uh, that's a form of an apparition of the living. And we have lots of records of apparitions of living people. That would include that person who went out of body and was seen as a ghost or just showing up to somebody else elsewhere. That can happen intentionally or spontaneously. Uh, when someone is seen in two places at once, that is often called bilocation. There are deathbed apparitions, visions, people on their deathbed, like my friend Annette Martin I mentioned before, who saw her parents who came to help her to the uh, help her finish dying. Those are more and more reported, but the first book on deathbed apparitions is from the early days of psychical research in the early 20th century. And then of course our favorites for all of us, I think is apparitions of the dead. This all comes from GNM Terrell and a book called apparitions. All right. So here's some ideas about, <clears throat> apparitions of the interactive and seemingly conscious entities. First, we're dealing with the independent consciousness of a deceased person. We're talking about an apparition of the dead. Now, the question comes up about physical makeup. Um, is an apparition physically there? And if the apparition is physical or material makeup, then there should be, it's some, if it's some kind of manner, or some other substance manifested by the entity, what people often call ectoplasm. By the way, ectoplasm was a term coined by Charles Roche, who was involved in parapsychology or psychical research. And it was a term that was used to describe what spirit, physical mediums claim to be manifesting. It's spirit, ectoplasm or spirit matter. It's not what you see in the pictures. Um, people send pictures of like smoky things, even if it wasn't smoke or water vapor. That's not ectoplasm. That's not what, not what the team term actually refers to. If they are physical material makeup, they should be either able to reflect light or give off light. They should be optical and create sound waves. They should be perceived by normal means, normal senses, although perhaps heightened, maybe focused attention. Uh, there are some people who have extraordinary vision, extraordinary uh, hearing, extraordinary other senses. They should be also perceived psychically, both, so physically and psychically. And they should affect space or interact with physical material objects. Okay. A lot of people say they are. Problem is that that's not what the experiences really indicate. The flip side of this is that they are non-physical in the sense they're still in the physical universe but I would say in, immaterial or not corporeal, can't touch them. Some kind of energy or other substance, if there's a if substance is even the right word, a field of some kind that may not exist here in our physical space per se, could be in a higher dimension that interacts with our physical space or an energetic form representative of self or foremost consciousness. Uh, it doesn't reflect light, doesn't create physical sound waves. It's perceived by people sometimes with super normal senses, but we're not even sure what that means. There, it's definitely perceived psychically, or it's a formless consciousness that projects form, voice, 
telepathically using ESP and the way it has to in interact because it doesn't have any physical qualities to, the, to it at all, it's through psychokinesis, mind over matter. Ever wonder how somebody without a body could actually see you or hear you? It's all perception. So people report seeing, hearing, feeling, sometimes smelling apparitions, but you can have a group of people in the same room and some people, there might be one or two who see the apparition, somebody else hears a voice, somebody else feels a presence, somebody else smells a smell associated with that person, and several people have no experience at all. So if this is a physical material thing, and we, we do know quite a bit about heightened senses for that matter, or physical senses, then how come not everybody is having that experience? So if they're material, how can that be given the above? Not everybody's senses pick them up the same way at all. And recording devices generally cannot detect them or record them. I see a ghost in front of me. Maybe I have heightened senses, but there isn't a camera in the world that can take a picture of that apparition. The way I'm seeing that apparition with the rarest exception in our history. The rare exception being apparently the apparition wanted to be on that picture, on that film. In other words, affecting the device. So when it comes right down to it, apparitions are not optical or acoustical phenomenon. If you record EVP, even by definition of electronic voice phenomena, if you could hear it and other people could hear it, if it was a, a physical acoustical sound, that would be voice phenomena, not electronic voice phenomena. You could record it just like you can record my voice right now. I am providing voice phenomena, an acoustical phenomena. My voice, my, my larynx is vibrating, my vocal cords creating a movement of the air, which is creating sound waves. There is no indication that apparitions create sound waves. There is indication that occasionally apparitions or spirits in general seem to be able to affect electronic devices and the definition of electronic voice phenomena is voice phenomena or voice created within the device itself electronically. In other words, something's affecting the electronics of the de recording device or even the effectively electronic nature of the recording medium, the flash drive, for example. Most apparitional experiences, probably more than 90, 90% closer to 95, they're one time or short term, they involve family, friends, loved ones. They rarely ever include physical effects. They sometimes have verifiable information, but usually that verifiable information is, you didn't know they were dead, they appear to you, and now you find out that they're dead. That's usually the most verifiable. By the way, when they're seen, uh, if they are seen or perceived, you have to remember that perception and sight, visual perception and sight are two different things. I have light coming into my eyes I, from this reflected light off of my bookshelf, off the things behind me, my ring light that's up there. It's giving off light, going into my, my eye, hitting the back of my retina, sending signals down my optic nerve and my occipital load. My brain makes sense of that. It's possible for me to see something that isn't there. That's called a hallucination. People have those experiences and they look very, very real. So if the hallucination is not coming from inside me, but it's coming from a guy standing out there or who is out there is an apparition, a consciousness, who's essentially sending me a signal of what they look like, it gets added to my visual perception and I see it or I hear it if it's auditory and so on. So interesting about these experiences is people, people are often surprised because Uncle Harry, who just died, they didn't even know he just died. Uncle Harry appeared to me last night uh, at, at, 5, at 12, 15 p.m., just as I'm going to bed. And he, it was weird. He looked like he was like 35 years old, but he was 95 when, when I last saw him. And then you find out that morning when you're telling this to somebody, oh, Uncle Harry died at 12, 15 last night. Uncle Harry looked a lot healthier as a ghost because that's probably how Uncle Harry thought of himself. Some few apparitional experiences are longer term, sometimes very long term, uh, involve strangers who didn't know that didn't know that person when they were alive, strangers who didn't know the location was haunted at all. And then there are some rare experiences where it seems that the ghost has learned how to move things. 
Uh, it usually takes months after the person first is being seen or experienced. And we would call that apparitional psychokinesis, psychokinesis being mind over matter. As evidence for survival, we have ver verifiable veridical apparitions that can provide even more information than just their appearance. We have multiple witness experiences. The USS Hornet Aircraft Carrier Museum is a good example of multiple witnesses seeing the same apparitions at the same time, but also over time. So maybe you didn't know the place was haunted, but you saw this woman uh, in the corner over there wearing a 1920s dress and you asked the wait staff about that because you were in a restaurant and say, oh yeah, you probably saw the ghost, the blue lady. You didn't even know the place was haunted. And then there's interactivity. The apparition is, is clearly conscious as opposed to a recording of somebody. The best apparition cases involve multiple sightings of the same apparition, multiple witnesses, so more than one person sees the apparition over time, could be different people at different times, several people at one time, but over time, singly and together. There is interactivity, an attempt at communication with the ghost tries to communicate or interact with you. You might bring in multiple psychics and mediums, with the same information, they get the same information over time, not knowing anything about that ghost, or they add to it, kind of adds back into the, the story. You might have multiple encounters over time from strangers with limited or no knowledge of this apparition, and it all fits together. And you get often, or you get sometimes ver verifiable, unknown, previously unknown information that you have to go try to check out. So, of course, there are other things that ghost hunters and paranormal investigators look at. So evidence for survival, apparitions, yes. Hauntings, maybe. So a haunting, we typically refer to place memory or what people call residual hauntings, an imprint of the past. Could be recent past, could be a long time ago, but the recording is of people who were alive when they made the recording. So the haunting imprint, that residual is of people who still may be alive. In fact, most of the time they are still alive. <clears throat> so in some instances, though, an apparition may haunt a place. And really, haunt means location. A haunt is a place. A haunt is a place that people haunt all the time. Most regulars at a bar or restaurant haunt that restaurant or bar. Um, if you're fans of the old TV show Cheers, Norm and Cliff were haunting Cheers. That's their old haunt. And after they died, or after they die, because the actors are still alive, of course, they may go back to Cheers. And poltergeist phenomena is purely physical, does not involve uh, the way the term is used in parapsychology. It does not involve deceased people, ghosts, spirits. If a spirit moves something that's psychokinesis by the apparition, most poltergeist cases don't even have apparitions connected whatsoever. It's purely physical. It's coming from a living person or person. Sometimes it's a group. It's <clears throat> kind of a synergy of unconsciousness from pe various people. Then we have uh, after-death communication research and techniques. Of course, there's automatic writing. Um, and a form of automatic writing, as much as you may not like them, the talking boards, the spirit boards, that's using automatic writing and Ouija board, planchette movement, involves, unless it's purposeful, uh, by someone playing the game with you, is typically an, what's called idiomotor response. It's unconscious muscle impulses. And uh, whether you use a pendulum, or dowsing rods, or talking boards, or automatic writing, all of that is you. But it, it could be that your unconscious is picking up on spirit, and you're kind of acting as a medium, and that's working through you. Uh, instrumental transcommunication is any technology, electronic technology used to communicate with spirit, or for them to communicate with us, because a lot of times it's not about us communicating with them. Electronic voice phenomena is a form of that. <clears throat> and of course, we have audio EVP, which is recorders. There have been phone calls from deceased people, text messages from deceased people. So there's some really interesting ones out there. There's, of course, photos and video, but, but there are some issues here I'll talk about. People have used uh, environmental sensors, but you know, if, if the needle on a tri-field meter starts moving and you think it's a ghost doing it, is it really picking up the electromagnetic field or is that apparition just walking over or moving over to the, the meter and flicking their finger, their spirit finger, 
at the needle to make it move up and down. In other words, is that device actually picking up what it's supposed to be picking up? We don't know. Uh, the same thing with the flashlights. You know, there's so much. The, part of the problem here is there's two problems. Number one, too many alternative explanations <clears throat> for all of this stuff that are not psychic survival sci or somatic sci. It's not coming from a dead guy. It's not coming from a living person. But there's always the, the question because we have tons of evidence that living people can affect electronic devices. So, And we have significantly no evidence for sure that deceased people can do that not in the same surety or statistical way that we know that living people can affect these things. So it's very possible that if you have devices that are operating, uh, nobody's seeing a ghost, nobody's having an experience, you're just relying on the technology. It may be the living people that are causing that to happen. But there are too many alternative explanations for all of this, um, especially for um, photography <clears throat> and video and especially for EVP, uh, and especially we talk about EVP where you ask a question, you get something on the recorder, and it's completely out of context. First of all, you should know, if you do not know this already, the people have gotten EVP at haunted locations where they picked up the haunted, the residual haunt itself. More than one person's voice, additional sounds like gunfire and things like that. So that doesn't really speak well to it being spirit at all, especially since people are experiencing the same recording over and over again as well. There's too much out of context responses. It's easy when you do, you know, flash once for yes and twice for no. It's easy to make your responses fit the questions and vice versa. And unless you get real information or it's totally in context and very clear, and there's somebody else there who's saying, oh, there's a ghost here just relying on the tech is bad science because none of that technology can be at this point designed to detect anything paranormal. Whereas human beings, we are designed. In fact, we define it that way. There is the idea of pareidolia or matrixing. People will look at a cloud and see a face in it. I got a guy who every once in a while sends me video of what he says is a dragon. Uh, the cloud looks like a dragon or part of a dragon coming in from another dimension. I'm scared it's going to take over our world. It's been going on for 10 years. Um, we are human beings wired to look for patterns in everything. So, and that also is audio. We're looking for patterns also in audio sounds. We make incorrect conclusions and interpretations. There's faulty equipment. There's equipment open to interference. K2 meters are worthless. Anybody anywhere nearby has, an, has a cell phone that's on, and there's things in other rooms, electrical wiring, all of that can affect a K2 device. Devices have unknown designer workings. We hit, we have a number of those things being sold to ghost hunting folks um, where the person refuses to say actually how it works. They give you a general idea, but you know whatever that Kinect camera is picking up that is showing up as a stick figure on your pad your uh, tablet, how is that programmed? What are the algorithms? What's being programmed? And unless we can really take that apart, there's really no way to know what, that, what it's doing, especially since we know the Kinect device with an Xbox gets a lot of false positives. And there's also most often a lack of any corroboration for the presence of apparitions of discarnate entities, of spirits. So you can go to a haunted place or a place that looks spooky like an old prison. Oh, there must be ghosts in the prison. Get all sorts of stuff on your devices means absolutely nothing about the place being haunted. In fact, maybe you brought the ghosts with you. So let's finish up here with mediumship. And there are two different kinds of mediumship. <clears throat> or just generally, there's mental or psychic mediumship. Trans mediumship falls in there as well, where information comes through, whether it is a, if you go into trance, you let somebody come into you, you know, people would say that's possession. Uh, of course, that's not the Western Judeo-Christian de definition of possession. That's an anthropological definition. I let a spirit come into me. I'm possessed by that spirit. I kick the spirit out. That's fine. Uh, but mental mediums, psychic mediums, evidential mediums typically are mentally communicating with spirit. Physical mediums may have, may go into trance or an altered state, claim to communicate with spirits. 
the focus being on the spirits working through the medium to cause physical things to happen, typically in the dark, which is a real problem for research. Um, and very little information that would indicate that they were actually talking to a spirit. Real phenomena might happen, but not necessarily from spirits. So for us, mediumship or spirit communication needs verifiable evidential information, not just facts and figures, which one can dig up on the internet, but also you want information that truly indicates that that medium is having a conversation with somebody. Um, can describe the way they talk, can describe some idiosyncrasies about the words that they use or the concept they use, personality variables. And, you know, sometimes if you're really observant and someone is on the phone, they're holding their phone up to their ear and they're pretending to have a conversation with someone versus actually having a conversation with someone, you can sometimes tell if you really look at them. Watching mediums, because I have, because of the Forever Family Foundation, uh, we have tested, certified, and we work with mediums under a variety of conditions. And you can tell when that medium is having a conversation. More importantly, I'm going to get to the last point here on mediumship in a moment. Um, we have to try to set up experiments or situations where we can exclude that I'm picking up information from that person who's asked me to talk to their Uncle Harry. We certainly have to exclude fraud or unconscious even unconscious cold reading, observation and conclusion that way. So there's been research looking at qualitatively what's the form and, and how verifiable is the information to, so how much of the information, how, what's the quality of the information? When I say quality, are they describing personality? Are they able to describe um, speech patterns or at least the way the person is? not just what they look like, not just a specific message here and there. It's gonna be more than just messages and more than just cold facts. Psychics can get cold facts, mediums get more than that. Quantitative research, <clears throat> you measure all that. So a medium does a reading for somebody, how many of the statements were actually true? How general are they? And you kind of measure all of that. And the Winbridge Research Center in Tucson, Arizona is doing significant research under extraordinarily controlled conditions to try to remove the possibility of ESP with living people as much as possible. And, and, and we can talk more about that after I'm done speaking tonight, if anybody has a question about it. But I would suggest you go to Windbridge. So just like it sounds, windbridge.org and read up on their research. It's pretty impressive. Also, um, what's interesting is... <clears throat> You know, these are evidential meetings to provide the verifiable specific statements, but they folks, these really good evidential, well-controlled conditions. And on top of that, they like doing research. We have a lot of mediums who love helping us learn more about how they work and what's going on. Um, and, and again, Winbridge has done stuff extraordinarily blinded where the medium doing the reading at that moment only is given one thing. There's a spirit ready to talk to you. Her name is Sandy. That's all the medium is told. And there's a process to keep even the experimenter who asked that question away from who Sandy is. And then the reading is transcribed and given down the line back to uh, essentially the person whose relative Sandy is. So there's, there's more steps involved with this. Also been brain activity. There is different. I think our guest has frozen. Yeah, I was just messaging you at the same time you were messaging me. <laughs> uh, well, or there's something sincerely going on, but certainly that medium's not faking it. Is this evidence for survival? Well, the question again relates to whose side is it? What's the information?
Yeah, technical issues on Lloyd's end. Gosh, I love this stuff, though. <laughs> yeah, I always <laughs> like his presentations. I've got three pages of questions <laughs> for me. Well, filling in while he's in another dimension, you know, a good medium should be able to tap into the spirit's personality, not just just facts about the person, but they should be able to to feel, was this person a lighthearted jokester or was this person, you know, a serious matter of fact type of person? That's a sign of, of, of a good medium, not just spreading out facts yep. like, oops, is he back? And then this also depends on, the, on excluding all sorts of other explanations or more unlikely. And it depends on our, frankly, on our currently literally limited understanding and conception of subconsciousness, by the way, and the brain. We still don't know a lot about the brain. Big question, what survives the death of the body and in what form? So can we say what can survive? we can't even come to consensus what consciousness is. Can I prove or say without knowing what consciousness Does our personality, the thing that is me, that is I, continue at the body? If so, how do we know? How does it interact? Again, we look at the evidence. An interpretation symbol. Darn solar flare today. <laughs> is it psi or super psi of the living? survival the best explanation well it depends on the experience and the phenomena that's been it depends on looking for alternative explanations both the psychic and, the, and allowing for new alternatives as science learns hope we uh -oh. lost him completely uh -oh. yep he's gone <laughs> 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 we had some questions we wanted to ask, and hopefully he'll be back. Yep. Yeah, and he's actually out of the back studio now, too, so he's completely logged off of StreamYard. <laughs> you know, talking about evidence and skeptics, there's so much written evidence out there. There are near-death experience book after book after book that's been written. There's... Mm -hmm books on mediumship, you know, evidence, but if skeptics aren't willing to review the evidence, there's yeah. nothing you can do about it. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. evidence is out there, but then how do you turn evidence into proof just because it's documented and written down? That's still not proof. Mm -hmm. Some people yeah. would say. So I wanted to ask him, how would that be proof and not evidence? What would, what would have to change for it to be proof instead of just evidence? Or, mm -hmm. or, can, or could it be? Could it be changed from evidence to proof? Right. Um, but, you know, there's such slippery slopes when it comes to parapsychology and the spirit world as far as how do you say it's proof? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and that's what we need to get through before we can start doing any form of official documentation and yeah, just, proving that it's there. In the scientific world, scientific method, this proof, is, is it labeled that it can only be considered proof as if it's replicable, if you can do it in a lab and get the same results over and over? Is that what they consider proof? For the most part? Yeah, which, yeah. you know, until we can create a consciousness in a lab, which things impossible so how how can we turn the evidence into proof that's the hard part that we all face right Doing but you could still do um some experiments that we're doing um include yeah. more or less uh doing the experiment and seeing yeah. if there's any type of result not so much getting the same answer or repetitive but you know just something happening oh here he is okay <laughs> So here's the problem with only watching a PowerPoint. I have no idea that I was off. And I don't even know <laughs> uh, we were, you were at the end of the mediumship slide. So when you okay. went into another dimension, <laughs> I'm blaming it on the solar flare today. Yeah. Was there a solar flare today? Yeah. Huge one. 
All right, let me uh, today. Let me see if I can figure this out here. And if I can get this to actually share the right, the right thing. Come on. My dog is snoring. It's not a ghost or a demon or anything. So if you might hear weird sounds, my dog is like snoring like crazy. Uh, in about gotcha. 10, 15 minutes, my son might be snoring. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me see if I can bring this up. Let me just go here and I'll go back. Can you see it? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So where was I? Um. To the mediumship part. Um, keep yeah, going. Around here. Keep going. Keep going. Yep. Yeah. Was that it? I think so. It was not That's too far from that mediumship slide. Okay. Well, this is this is uh, almost the end here. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll. This will be deja vu for me, but I'll go ahead and do it again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So when we're dealing with um, mediumship, we work with evidential mediums for people who can provide really good evidence for us. But the question, of course, ultimately is whose psi, whose ESP is working? And actually, the answer is both. Uh, if a medium's talking to a spirit, communicating, that's communication via ESP tele telepathically, mind to mind. So we have psi happening on the side of the spirit, that's survival psi and psi happening on the part of the medium. But ultimately a question that's always been around in our field when it comes to mediumship is, is the medium actually communicating with spirits or is the medium picking up information from living people and other sources that are available? So ultimately, when we look at any of these areas, reincarnation, apparitions, the out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, all of these things, the survival hypothesis, which pulls from all of them, used to support it. It depends on the evidence. So if I say, all right, my hypothesis is consciousness survives the death of the body. <clears throat> but that really depends on the evidence that can be gathered. It depends on the interpretation of the evidence, which can also depend on excluding alternative explanations as more unlikely, including psychic ones, other psychic ones. And for us, it also depends on the, you know, it's our currently limited understanding limited understanding of on concept even on definition of consciousness uh, we don't even know everything we need to know about the brain for that matter at this point so the question is what survives what's the form of that what's the difference between a spirit that, that mediums talk to on the other side and a spirit that's still here what we call an apparition you know and we have really interesting ex explanations of that these are people who haven't left yet. Where, wherever it is they go, uh, we certainly can't say what the other side is like. Can we say that what might survive, you know, what, what it is that survives? Can we say what consciousness is if we can't come to a consensus of what consciousness is in the body? So if it can survive, how does it interact and how would we know? Again, we have these experiences. Are there other explanations? For the experiences is there bad philosophical thinking that's what you know so a materialist would say that thinking that um consciousness can survive the death of the body is actually bad thinking and they often sometimes they'll say it's because you know everything's the brain so but if i if you're a dualist and you believe right off the bat that conscious that mind and body or mind and brain are not necessarily the same thing that mind is more than brain or even slightly different than brain, then looking at the evidence, it's pretty clear what's going on. Or can we just invoke the idea of super duper psi, ESP? So is survival the best explanation? It depends on the experience and phenomena and depends on looking for alternative explanations. It depends on allowing for new alternatives. And it also depends on your personal and that's including scientific, personal interpretation and conclusion based on your personal paradigm, biases, philosophy. But it comes back to this question, what is consciousness when it's seemingly in the body? 
So is it all wishful thinking or do we think that there is evidence for survival of consciousness? Again, even within the field of parapsychology where people are studying these things, they will have different answers to that question. My answer is there is evidence, significant evidence for survival of consciousness. It's not just wishful thinking. Gertrude Schmeiler once said something on the order of survival is one of the only areas of parapsychology research in which we'll only know if we're right that survival happens when we die. And that's, of course, when we die. In other words, if there's nothing after death, we won't know anything. So we can never know if we're wrong. Although the people who don't believe there's life after death will find that they're wrong. And my favorite quote from a science fiction writer about this subject, there's no such thing as the supernatural. There are only things we don't understand yet. So we will understand many of these things, maybe not in our lifetimes, but the, the, I, the question of what is consciousness is being more and more and more looked at by more and more people. And it all relates to what we're doing in, in research in the paranormal and psychic phenomena. That's all consciousness related phenomena, all important to us. All right, these are my books. Uh, I have a couple of my other, other older books uh, back out in print real soon. Contact information is there. Uh, I encourage you to join the Forever Family Foundation. It's free to join. And also the Rhine Research Center. That's rhine.org. Uh, join huge media library if you're interested in presentations. And also you get discounts on classes. There is a link to the Education Center right there on the Rhine Center site. Um, I'm starting a class next Tuesday on, on the 9th uh, called Developing Intuition, which is really psychic development. And then uh, I'll be teaching some other investigative related question, uh, classes in the fall as well. And there are, of course, other classes by a number of other folks who now teach through the Rhine Center, all online. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Okay. And that's it. So I think I can stop sharing now. God, I love this stuff. Jumping back to mediumship and investigating, um, in my experience, um, you know, when you're when you're communicating with a spirit that has crossed over, gone to the light, so to speak, they will only be coming back with healing, uplifting messages for the survivors. Whereas usually in a haunting situation, they're not always nice. So it's well, I, I have to disagree with you because I've, I've witnessed a number of times where the person who's coming back was a little more confrontational. Let's put it that way. Were they, had they really left? Do we not? Oh, well, they, they were on the, this is a, some of the mediumship situations with some of the mediums, the forever family foundation. So, um, you know, somebody, somebody wants to see, speak to their, you know, somebody starts, uh, or the medium starts talking about a male figure coming through and yeah. some woman eventually says, yeah, that that's my father, but I want to talk to my mother. And the mediums, mediums like, your father says your mother doesn't want to talk to you. And here's why. And it's not mm -hmm. necessarily very nice. This could be definitely some unresolved issues. And, yeah. You know, I mean, you it, also need to explain to the sitters, it's not like calling up somebody on the cell phone. You can't right. call for a particular person. And a lot well, of sitters think it's a bad medium because they didn't get Aunt Betty. It's like well, actually, you know, I've it. seen that I've seen that happen where uh, the medium's got a bad review because they didn't they didn't talk to the right person. Yeah, and even though the medium's full ex full explain, I mean, if you make a phone call to somebody at their, especially now on the, if they have a landline anymore, the odds are you're going to get like in my house, you're going to get <clears throat> their answering machine because we have so many telemarketers calling that we don't actually even answer the phone anymore unless we yeah, hear it. True. But you know, in 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 past times, you can call somebody and they're not home, right? Exactly. Somebody else picks up. Maybe one of their kids picks up. Or the spouse. If they're, if they're in another world, they may be doing something different and not even near the phone. Or wanting to talk to maybe they don't want to talk to you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, and and I think that's as far as the you know the difference there, typically there's a process going on that's different than the, the apparitions or the folks who are still here. Yeah. And they're still here, and there's there's a psycho much more of a psychology involved. Like they're much closer to they were when they were alive. And frankly, if they were an asshole when they were alive, they're still an asshole. Excuse me. Oh, yeah. Um, now, getting back to, um, let's say we have four people in a room, three of them see an apparition and one does it. Could that be connected to that person's own energy? It's it's like 
I, I wouldn't say energy. I would say that it could be that they're not very not psychic in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, because not every psychic the same way um, that they don't process information the same way as other the others are not visually. Maybe they're hearing something. I mean, I have never seen an apparition. I have been walked through. I have felt them. I have smelled them. Um, even yeah. heard, but I've never visually because my apparently my brain doesn't process the psychic information that way. But then there's the other side is that if that person who's not seeing anything is a total, let's say, disbeliever, mm -hmm. they are blocking their psychic perceptions. They're and not I, going to see somebody. Yeah, true. And a clairvoyant vision of a of a person in spirit is completely different than an apparition appearing before people That's well it's still, it's still technically it's still either a form of telepathy or clairvoyance one way or the yeah. other telepathy yeah. all right well there are people i had questions in the chat and i think heather has them yep okay. i have them all saved Ready. and i'll go all the way to the top of the saved ones stephanie started off with can you give an example of proof and evidence when investigating in the field what is considered good evidence well there's no proof in the field there's evidence in the field. Um, one, you know, one point of evidence, uh, depending on the detail, the amount of detail that comes through. So if a human being providing uh, the evidence, a story, or here's my experience of a ghost. And you can take that and indicate and find that that person really existed. And you can actually figure out that the person didn't know anything about that spirit wasn't imagining because of what they already knew. That would be really good evidence of a single invest single person's experience. If a person had an experience with an apparition, let's say, and it turns out that there's five other people, unbeknownst to that one person, that had the same, uh, saw the same person, had the same experience. For example, one of my cases, uh, it was a year and a half into this family moving into the house that they found out that their son was seeing and talking to the ghost almost every day. They had each, the father, mother, and even the woman's mother who occasionally visited, had individually seen the apparition, but were, were, didn't want to talk about it because they didn't want to freak out anybody else. So they all had the same experience or the experience of the same woman. It's just the one kid was pulling real information, which we could verify beyond that. But that joint experience, when they're not talking to each other about it, is really good evidence. What's mm -hmm. not good evidence is walking in, into a... a a reportedly haunted place, even if somebody had an experience and I get a high reading on an EMF meter. And that's all I got. Uh, I've, I've got people with me. Nobody's sensing a spirit. The witnesses aren't. Well, there's nobody here. Uh, there's a psychic who's not who's saying there's nobody here. You know what I got? I got a really interesting reading on my EMF meter. If my EMF meter is going off and some completely different device is also setting being set off. So, for example, you can have different types of electromagnetic field sensors that don't pick up the same thing or even the same way. And we've got two, for example, one picks up radiation or the strength of the field. The other one picks up uh, changes in the field, the natural field that's around us. So even a human being can affect that. A living human can affect that. They both pick up something and they're both stationary. That indicates there's some real effect. Now, I can't say that it's a ghost per se, because I need somebody to tell me there's a ghost there. We need a human detector in some way, or it has to co correlate to some part of a story. So with <clears throat> hauntings, the residual imprints, if people consistently experience something in one part of the house at a certain time, and you get unusual readings at that time or near that time uh, in that area of the house, and there's nothing else going on, nobody else is picking anything up, but different devices are picking up something in that spot, and you can eliminate all the normal things that might affect that device, those devices. Uh, I, there are places I've been to where the wiring was so old and bad that I couldn't I had to turn off my EMF meter and leave it away. I just couldn't use it. In fact, we were only using it to see if it connects to haunting experiences or if there's an apparition present, what's going on? That's what I want to know, just what's going on. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't consistent. It's not consistent with apparitions. So good evidence is correlative. It connects to the experience. It connects to a, preferably an experience in time. Uh, it connects to other people's experiences. Multiple forms of technology might pick up something unusual or anomalous at the same, same time. And the best would be at the same time 
that a human is having an experience. Mm -hmm. And we had a case years ago in Florida. Uh, one day the video, we'll actually see the light of day. I'm talking to the, it was a TV pilot, an unaired TV pilot, which we came close to selling a couple of times. Although the, rec the uh, requests, the budget was not enough and didn't make sense for us to do it. Um, we had, because we were also working with Japanese TV, we had rented a lot of different scientific equipment, environmental sensors, including a geomagnetic sensing station, which is basically picking up the Earth's magnetic field very localized. That was like a $3,000 a week piece of equipment. We had thermal vision cameras also. And when uh, the Japanese medium was actually speaking, ostensibly speaking to the ghost, Beside the fact that you could see her hand was hotter than the rest of the environment, which could have been blood flow. So it didn't have to be paranormal, but every piece of equipment, we had different types of EMF meters. We had the thermal vision camera was picking up some weird stuff right below her hand, which the company said, you can't pick up anything in midair. Um, we had a Geiger counter going off, which kind of freaked us all out. We had the geomagnetic sensing station like boost all of a sudden like so badly it got out. Of, we had to recalibrate the whole thing. And all this was going on at the same time. But the only thing we could say that there was a ghost there was Mrs. Gibo, the medium. Okay. And whoop, lost that. There we go. And the next question is, so would you say it, it's fair to include subjective experiences as evidence? We have to because that's the only way we even know that there was a ghost there to begin with. Plus the fact that most social science is based on subjective observations and subjective experience. We'd have to throw out most of psychology if you want to throw out subjective experiences. Mm -hmm. okay. We list that as personal experiences in our client report because we say it's not related to an instrument reacting. This is something subjective that's mm -hmm. personal. So we put it in evidence, but in a different category. Okay. Fair. Paul says, thanks, Lloyd. The power of the brain is amazing. What are your thoughts on somebody who is very sick, but looking forward to an event which somehow keeps them alive? Once the event is over, they pass on. That really shows the connection between our minds and bodies. It strongly suggests that if medical, if Western medicine actually put more emphasis on that, that we might be able to affect better healing, even with Western medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, we, um, former clinical research often uses the placebo as the alternative for tests for clinical testing. And sometimes the, the drug is only like five or 10% more effective than placebo. Mm -hmm. And they put it on the market. So why are they not, you know, Placebos don't have side effects unless you tell people they do. Uh, so why in the world are we letting this drug go out with too many side effects unless it really is efficacious compared to placebo? Mm -hmm. And there's not a lot of research that's been done on, pl on the placebo effect. It's just an accepted effect in medical science uh, and medical research and such. Uh, there's been some... Um, but it really shows, I mean, that alone shows the power of the mind. Because some people get healed or can heal themselves or feel completely better with a saline selection, a saline solution injected into them, even if they're told it's a placebo. That's what some of the research shows. Yeah, we definitely need to do some more research on that. Yeah, I thought I needed a hip replacement, and I was afraid to go to the doctor. And finally, finally, after suffering tremendously for a long time, orthopedic said, uh, you just have bursitis. There's nothing wrong with your hip joint. And uh, the kind of the pain went away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's know, I'm not in fear. I was like, of having a hip replacement now. It's like, I should. Yeah, it's it's uh you know there's mind over the body so many so it's my it's totally mind over matter. There's so many good examples of people actually, uh, not just what the uh, the one person said, but also people who have, have remission from cancer, mm -hmm. or come out of a, a coma, or, or have some other really seemingly miraculous thing happen to them. Um, it's really interesting that when you have a, a, an older couple that have been with them each other entire lives and one of them dies, um, unfortunately, it seems that the other one very often dies within a few months. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, 
And it's, it, you know, it's sad, but maybe it's not sad mm -hmm. if there's life after death. Yeah. Well, it's like the story I always share with my kidney disease. Four years ago, I was diagnosed with stage five kidney failure. And they ran tests and they said nothing was wrong with my kidneys. My blood work was just showing that it was failing. And after a few days of my pity party, I finally said, no, I'm not going to let this get the best of me and just started thinking positively. And now I fluctuate between stage one and stage two. That's great. That's yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. You know, there, there's something to be said. My friend Martin Caden, uh, who was a mentor and friend of mine who did, who was a science and science fiction writer, <clears throat> um, Marty um, was kind of a much, much larger than life character. He, he created the $6 million man through his book, Cyborg. He was a consultant in NASA. He was an aviation expert. Um, he wrote over a couple hundred books in fiction and nonfiction. And Marty, when he was diagnosed with thyroid cancer, first of all, it was misdiagnosed. His doctor diagnosed something going on with him incorrectly. So by the time he was diagnosed with thyroid cancer, it had spread throughout his body. And the problem was, of course, that thyroid cancer is easily treatable if it's caught early on. And had his doctor made the right diagnosis or Marty had gone for a second opinion, he would still be with us today. In the meantime, he called me up. Um, to, he had been to, he went to the Mayo Clinic to get that final opinion. And he called me up and he said to me that, um, you know, what was going on? And he said, they're giving me eight weeks to live. And knowing Marty, I said, yeah, what, what the hell did you tell them? And he used some very choice language, basically tell them what right do they have to tell him how long he can live? And he lasted about a year and a half. I mean, it was already fairly advanced, but he went through another year and a half. And he told me that until the last, those last couple of, year, couple of weeks in, in hospice, he would call the doctors at the Mayo Clinic and cuss them out once he got past the eight weeks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, medical Bob science, I, I, doctors, I think, think they're doing, a good, they're doing a nice thing for people, telling them to get, the, get their stuff in order. Yeah. But mm -hmm. you're giving them a deadline, yeah. literally. Yeah. And they're not God. Yeah. No. Okay. Bob had asked earlier, I get EVPs all the time. Why is that not good evidence? Are there spirits around? How do you know where it's coming from? Maybe it's coming from you. In fact, we, uh, we know that there are, you know, I've certainly talked to people who tell me that so-and-so in a particular group always gets EVP no matter where they go. Mm -hmm. I have to say that either they got a ghost following them around <laughs> who's trying to give them evidence constantly. And I want, I would want to hear what those messages are at that point, because they're probably trying to tell you something um, or you're doing it. Mm -hmm. It's either way. It's psychokinesis. I mean, it's either psychokinesis, an effect on the device by someone who's dead or an effect on the device by somebody who's alive, or maybe a combination of the two. We do a uh, practice where we all leave the, the location and go outside and do remote EVP sessions with a walkie-talkie. So it's like, well, we're not inside the location, so how could we be manifesting these EVPs? So when you say you're using a walkie-talkie, how are you using the walkie-talkie? We'll leave one in the house close to our recorders, and then we take the other one, and we'll like go far from the house, so to speak, like we... And then we have a standard 14 list of questions that we always ask, but there's some control questions in there too. And we'll do those. And then we'll ask questions that may be relating to the location, but we are far from recorders and the um, walkie talkie that we've left in the house. Mm -hmm. Well, first we don't know the limits of PK. I know that people have been able to do even poltergeist cases have happened with the person outside their house and stuff goes on inside their house. Mm -hmm. um, that's number one. Um, number two, the question that I would have a question of, well, you know, what made you think there was a spirit there to begin with? And are those responses clear enough and contextually and correct to the questions? That's, that's kind of what determines what's the quality of them uh, and what, how, how contextual are they that's providing and are they providing information that you didn't know or have to check out? Yeah. I mean, that's, we're experimenting. We're trying to come yeah. up with things that out of the box. You know, there, there, there's a story within our field of someone in the seventies, uh, a couple of EVP researchers who were very careful and they took some unopened cassette tapes 
yeah. and they put them in a place where people have been having having experiences. So a haunted place for sure. People had had experiences mm -hmm. there, and they said, "Please affect the tape," and they left. And when they got the tape the next day, and they opened it up and they played it, they had some voices on it. So you don't even need a recorder apparently for that. Michelle wants to know, can a spirit get in touch with you while you're in dream state? Absolutely. I have a whole chapter on that in my psychic dreaming book. Uh, they're often called visitation dreams. The dreams, when that happens, the dream feels feels very different. That's one of the key factors of a psychic dream. It, it feels like you're talking to that person. It's, it's like as if you were in the room with that person. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, that's a not an uncommon experience for people. They're very vivid. They're very... They're not metaphorical. They they come through very directly. Um, sometimes there's you know sometimes just messages of love, just some somebody saying goodbye, mm -hmm. but they feel very different than other dreams. Okay, and this was brought up when you were talking about past lives, birthmarks. Are they marks of killing wounds from previous life? And then Michelle had commented later. I saw her comment saying that she was curious about the same thing because both her and her husband have a white birthmark. Well, you know, there's not a specific birthmark one can determine unless you know who the previous personality was and how they died. Mm -hmm. So the, the pictures of birth, birthmarks that were collected from some cases that Stevenson had, uh, Erlander Haraldson had, uh, included um, a rope burn, what looked like a line across somebody's throat, uh, a, a child's throat, and the personality that child was remembering had been hanged. And there was um, somebody who was shot and there was you know a, a mark right where the bullet went into that previous personality on both sides. So that's in about 15% of the, of the, these children remember previous lives. It's a small number of cases uh, comparatively, but they typically represent violent or traumatic death in those circumstances. Okay. And then Michelle wants to know, what does it mean when you see a black orb? No idea. <laughs> Possibly something sure. optical with your eye. Run. Orbs don't mean anything. They have, nothing, they have nothing to do with the spirits at all. Yeah. Okay. And then, oops, that was talking about the white birthmark. Okay. Bob says, are there a finite number of souls being reincarnated over and over, or are new souls being created for all new births? Depends on the kind of reincarnation you believe in. We have no idea. From a I asked that in a mediumship um, course once. I said, because now the earth has more people than it's ever had before. So how are there new souls created for the new people? And they explained it as souls. There are many parts to a person's soul and they can, you know, fragment that, off. Yeah, that's, that's one belief. That's one belief system. Yeah. There are, you know, if you go into Hinduism or Jainism or some of the others, you'll find different beliefs, different interpretations of that. The rules vary from culture and religion to religion, culture to culture. The <clears throat> Inuit uh, up in, in Canada, um, which who believe in reincarnation, Antonia Mills, who's an anthropologist who did work with Stevenson, she found that they, they only believed they would be reincarnated in the direct family line. And therefore, all the reincarnation cases she dealt with where people, kids remember being the grandfather, great grandfather, grand, great uncle, mother, something genetically connected, right? In other cultures, you are not ever reincarnated in the direct family line, parts of India, that never happens. And then the question becomes, is the belief shaping the phenomena? Is, did the phenomena set the belief to begin with? Um, it, and if so, why? Or is this simply a matter of it, the Inuit only believe you can be, therefore any other family that re, that has a kid that remembers being somebody from Dayton, Ohio, would never even report it or talk about it because that's not possible, right? So that's a reporting artifact, which we you know, which is a concern um, when we're trying to figure out what's actually the rules are. But you know, I I, I had one professor who was a. He was a proponent of one form of mysticism, and he was teaching a course on the mystic vision, supposedly talking about all sorts of mystical, spiritual uh, belief systems. And he talked about the reincarnate cycle of reincarnation. And one of the students asked him very seriously, how many times do we get reincarnated? And very seriously, he turned around from the board where he's drawing this big circle. And he said, four million. 
<laughs> it's like that was that was it. Myself and one of the other parasites. We had we, we had to take this course as parapsychology students, and we both looked at each other and said, "Okay, this is total BS." <laughs> and he may be right, but where do you come up with a number four million? Not four million and one. Uh, so we talk about the number of people of all this stuff. We we have no idea, no idea. It's a it's a philosophical religious belief system, mythology, stories. We we just don't know. Okay, and then Bob also asks. I keep getting the same voice come through on an EVP at different locations. Am I bringing the spirits with me, or are they following me? Okay, so either it's you, which is possible, part of you that's doing it. Or maybe you do have somebody who's kind of follow, sticking with you and trying to get a message across to you. Or a combination of the two. And there's nothing that says we can't be techno mediums where a spirit is working with our unconscious to beef up the PK to affect that device too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know we had one case that we were doing. We were interviewing the client and I was talking to her in her home. And when we were, we had the video or the audio recorder just going just so we can document the interview. And when I was re reviewing it, we heard her voice say, get out. Oh, interesting. But it was, at, and she never said that to us, but it was her she voice. <laughs> yeah, she apparently wasn't happy about the conversation. Right. So you know, that, like, that's that's not, honestly, that's not the first time I've heard that. Yeah. And um, what's really interesting is when you play, when you get that and you play it back for, for the person whose voice you're hearing, Mm -hmm. it's always interesting to see their face because I don't know if you did it for her, but most of the no. people, when this has happened a very few times to me over the years, um, they totally freak out. <laughs> it's like, how'd you read my mind? No. <laughs> Your device is reading my mind. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sunshine wants to know how, have you seen the mediumship research by uh, Cruz and what do you think about it? Um, you know, I, I'm trying to remember I, that name sounds familiar. I, I might have actually seen it and kind of filed it along to everything else, but I'll make a note of that and take have to take a look. Okay. Yeah, off the top of my head, I, I can't tell you. Okay, and I'll let you write it down before I clear it out. Thank you. <laughs> yep, okay, and then Stephanie says, Can could survival of consciousness be what some call a soul? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, that soul has a lot of re religious connotation to it. So we try to, we tend to stay away from that term as much as possible. Um, but mind doesn't quite do it. I mean, consciousness really does do it. That's the term that used to be used in the early days of psychical research was human personality. Mm -hmm. So, you know, consciousness, the mm -hmm. thing that makes us us. And some would say that that's the soul. So sure. And then she also asked, do you think it's possible for a group of psychic mediums to be connected in such a way that they seem to amplify each other's abilities, even when they're not in the same location? Yes. Um, I've seen that in the same location. Uh, I think it's a social function when they're in the same location. Not, you know, it's, it's more of a psychological thing, not a serious mm -hmm. psychic thing that's happening. Uh, people, people engage, it's almost like a team effort in some respects. Uh, but I've also seen it where people who, you know, mediums who knew each other or connected in some way uh, are doing that when they're not in the same place. Yeah. Are you speaking of anybody in particular, Stephanie? She's on my team. <laughs> okay. And then Robin asked, there are studies of a deceased body losing weight right after death. Do you think this is a separation between consciousness and the brain? You know, there, there have not been really good replications of that original study from 1910 the 21 grams experiment. Mm -hmm. um, the Rhine Center had wanted to do, was, was going to try to do that um, with some out-of-body people. People do out-of-body travel. That's about the only way you can do it ethically. Uh, there, there's no real evidence other than that original study. Uh, there's been a couple with animals and one study turned out with um, less weight. Apparently another study turned out with more weight. So it, it, it's really... We don't think that, first of all, energy itself, or if it is energy, if consciousness is energy, or if it's a quantum particle field or so, whatever it is, does it have weight or does it, you know, or is there something else going on when mm -hmm. that, that happens? So we, there's not enough, there's really, unfortunately, there's not a, a really good ethical way to do this right now. Yeah. Okay. 
And that's it for the questions. We have 10 minutes. Philip, did you want to read off of your list? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so we know when people do astral traveling, they're doing it consciously. They're setting the intention to travel. Um, so a crisis apparition of a live person, you know, to another person, would that be considered an outer body experience for that person that appears? It, it may very well be. First of all, um, it's not the case that everybody does out of body consciously because there's a lot of people who do it when they're dreaming, yeah. <clears throat> and, a lot, and they're so that's that's an unconscious functionality to function to it. Um, it it's it's hard to you know a crisis apparition. We don't know because sometimes a person doesn't know they're you know usually an out of body experience. You see, you would be at that other person. You'd be asking them for help, right? Uh, whereas in normal crisis apparition situations, the person may even be unconscious and doesn't remember asking for help from that person necessarily. So it's hard to know, um, you know, any, we, we just, if it's an out of a living apparition, it is a living apparition in that sense, whether it's an actual telepathic projection where the person is just mentally connecting with that person and the person sees you because you're connecting or whether you've actually, part of you has actually gone out. We, there's not enough real good way to know that without the, <clears throat> the the victim being able to give us some information um in uh near-death experiences um the body's basically dead the heart stopped is there brain activity during uh um during this period i can't remember if there is or not is so it, it, yeah it's um you know we we keep pushing back the definition of death uh, yeah. really being where you can't resuscitate somebody. And the majority of near-death experiences, there was no attempt to find out what the brain activity was. Okay. You know, it could happen to somebody with a paramedic working on you, trying to resuscitate you, mm -hmm. and your heart stopped, and all functions look like they've stopped. But there's no way to know whether there's brain activity or not, because they're not putting an EEG system on your head. So we don't really know that we yeah. do know for specific cases, the case of Pam Reynolds, for example, um, case of uh, Evan Alexander, who wrote a book called Proof of Heaven. Not his title, it was the publisher's title, because it's not proof, nor is it heaven. Um, <laughs> and, but he, he, was, he had such lowered brain activity due to meningitis, bacterial meningitis, that there's just no way what he remembered could have happened. Yeah. Uh, and he actually was out of body and be able to describe things as well during the whole process. So um, that's a case where he wasn't, you know, he was not even brain dead at that point. His heart had not stopped, but effectively it was a near death experience because of everything else he went through uh, and his brain was not processing. So. Okay. And real quick, before you continue, uh, Stephanie has another question. This is related to a case that she has going on right now. Um, she wants to know what are your experiences with poltergeist activity brought on by extreme stress? Can stress trigger this activity where the agent is materializing items that the agent has never owned or seen before? I have a lot of experience with poltergeist cases, and the answer is yes. It's pretty rare for teleportation to happen like that, um, but it does happen from time to time. Um, I have not, I've actually not had that specific type of thing happening, but one of my colleagues actually had quite a bit of that in one of his cases kind of a big thing happened actually that was this one of the happened. items is a pepsi can where the homeowners don't drink pepsi somebody wants pepsi <laughs> is it a coke household <laughs> yeah and the there are the only people that have keys to this home are the husband and wife all that, all the locks have been changed because we were like okay is somebody sneaking in somewhere but yeah, that was one of the objects, and I'm like, how? That's that's pretty pretty intense for poltergeist manifestation of an object. Yeah, I have to look at have to look at all the other things that are being affected, and uh, you know, determine who who might be causing the phenomena, and then look into yeah. the psychology of all that. Uh, the Pepsi can must the Pepsi must represent something for that person. Mm -hmm. Okay. And obviously not uh, clearly not an obvious thing either. Oh. Yeah, there and was some other thing. A child's like, shoe. A funeral card from 1999 for a lady they didn't know has also appeared. Yeah. And, and has anybody in the, just, just out of curiosity, anybody in the situation, have they uh, experienced what they feel as a ghost or seen anything other than the physical activity? Shadow. They're seeing shadow people. 
Yeah, that's that's not necessarily indication of of that of yeah. anything you know, specific. Um, you know, so so first the thing to do is to identify who the person is under stress. There, there's obviously something going on, and maybe these items all pull together into pull together into a story <clears throat> that connects even to the history of the house. We've had um, residual haunting cases that actually caused the stress to cause a poltergeist case. Right. They built the house and there's nothing on the land previously. We've already. Wow. <laughs> okay. So yeah. Tough crowd. <laughs> it is. It's, it's very, it's an interesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, Phil, if you, if you want to consult at some point, Philip, you know, you and Stephanie want to do that. We can set up another time. We can talk, go through it. Yeah. Through I'd it. sent you, I'd ask you some of the information about the children. So that was earlier. the one you were sent. That was the one you asked yeah, me about. And, okay. and it just keeps, it just keeps getting deeper as we interview more. Do you people. have any suspicions of who it is? can't because i can't recall what you had said there the husband and wife the husband says his stress level is a two out of one to ten she says she's not under stress but that's i'm not buying it it's 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 there's a lot going on that we're trying to put in well you know the, the other thing to know is that sometimes these cases happen because in a small percentage of them because of issue neur neurological issues Mm -hmm. It's not only like emotional, physical, uh, or psychological stress. It can be neurology too. Um, <clears throat> epilepsy has been connected to a lot, to a number of them, but also epileptic like activity in the temporal lobes can apparently generate this as well. Uh, and with the neurological ones, they tend to be more random. So maybe this is something neurological. Um, one, one strange thing right before we go. All right. So our our minds, our consciousness, you know, our bodies need food to to make our brain work for energy. So our consciousness leaves our body. What is feeding that consciousness for it to be able to to live? Well, you know, we say we do EM, EMF enhancers in locations to feed the ghosts and things that people do all that. Yeah, stuff. That, that, that's really irrelevant. That, that's yeah. pretty irrelevant because, you know, 100 years ago, there weren't EMF enhancers. Exactly. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, the reason we need food and sleep and all those other things is we are biological beings yeah. and our cells need food. We also need oxygen to survive. If you are an energy field of some a coherent energy field or particle field or whatever the hell a ghost is you may be getting uh, who knows zero point energy maybe you're getting solar energy there's no way to know uh, mm -hmm. because we have no starting point to determine what a ghost actually is is made out of yeah. that's the problem now we you know it looks like apparitions can on occasion affect the electromagnetic field but they're not electromagnetic in nature because if they were We'd have stuff, you know, all sorts of issues with technology today uh, as they moved around a house. Yeah. <laughs> they, they'd interfere with everything. Forget about just, so there's an intent, seems to be an intentional effect with apparitional stuff in that way. So it's, but they're not electromagnetic and we, we know that. There are some things we do know that they're not, um, you know, not physical, not reflecting light, not giving off light, all mm -hmm. of this. We know those things, but what they actually are is a whole different question. And you can't really ask them because, you know, like what uh, Ambrose Beer said, they'd only, they have to study themselves. <laughs> so you'd have to have an, a ghost scientist would have to study another ghost to figure out what they actually were. Would a ghost on video be considered proof? Evidence, not proof. Not proof, yeah. Nothing on video is considered proof. Except photos are not considered dash proof. cams and car accidents yeah yeah, well, <laughs> yeah that, now there's legal proof or legal evidence that supports yeah. the conclusion of proof but i want to just point out one thing when it comes to photos and videos how long have we been getting photos and videos of ufos uh -huh. that have been studied by people with resources that we can't even come close to that have actually been of things that that multiple people saw and they were on radar uh -huh. and we can't say anything about what they are and only recently is are certain agencies even admitting that they're there so when we have something that seems to be at least seems to be physical that is witnessed 
clearly can be taken pictures of by different people at the same time. It is reflecting light. It's there. It's reflecting radar. And we still can't figure out what that makeup is, you know, partly because, you know, as far as we know, we don't have one sitting in Hangar 18. Great analogy. Thank you so much for this presentation. You know, I always love listening to you. Thank you. Like in your brain. Thank so you. she's um, got the Ryan Research Center at the bottom, the link. What do you have classes coming up soon? So next week, I start the uh, Developing Intuition, which is really developing ESP. Uh, Paul Smith, who has taught remote viewing, is actually going to be doing a dowsing class. We have a few other really interesting classes. Again, go to the Ryan Center site and click on education in the upper on the upper tab, and you'll see the list of courses we have up for August. These are short four-week classes. <clears throat> in the fall, I'm not sure what the full spread of classes are at this point, and they're not up and uh, up yet. They won't be up and uh, listed until early September. But <clears throat> I'm teaching again the advanced uh, investigations class. That one. Fantastic yeah. for everybody. That's um, although people need to have taken the first one to take that one, uh, generally, or a long conversation with me to. to, to <laughs> you know. um, <clears throat> then I'm. I'm I should be co-teaching a class called the Skeptical Approach to, to Parapsychology with a skeptic named Kenny Biddle. Really, a true skeptic, and he is somebody who knows more yes, about the effect than anybody does. You'll argue you into the ground. Yes. Well, you know the, the <laughs> most important impressive thing about Kenny is. He'll tell you how to build a REM pod for 20 bucks. Yeah. So, because he's taking these things apart. And there's some pieces of equipment he can't, he can take it apart only so far without getting into the programming, which is why there's sus suspect stuff going on. Um, <clears throat> but he's he's much more of a real skeptic. And, and the, we talked the course last fall. It was fun for us to, to teach, actually. And then I'll be teaching a four week class uh, <coughs> on investigative techniques. Oh, how investigative I'm... techniques have kind of come about. Oh, I need to do that one. And um, for those watching, if you can't go into the classroom live, they're all videoed and you have access to go back and watch them later, which is really right. good for people's schedules. Yeah, we, we've had students all over the world where their time zone, they would never watch yeah. it live because of their time zone. And I've gone back and watched them after being there live just to listen again. And you get so much more information. You had so many things to download and slides and articles and videos and so it's not it, it's a great value for the money I, it's just wonderful so that's all i've got thank you for joining us tonight yes, You're welcome. thank you yep and you guys can follow us on at ghost education 101 hopefully when we return in september i'll have our youtube channel back up and running i have a test one that i put up after our last one was shut down so we'll get that and we'll be sharing that when we come back um, we will return september 17th at 9 p.m eastern not sure what our schedule will be, but we will be on Parallax Network, um, Parapost Network, and also Ghost Education 101. So thank you, everybody, for watching, and thank you, Lloyd, for joining us tonight. Good night. Good night.